welcome back to The Short Game, the show where we talk about short video games. The sort of things that you can pick up and complete in an evening or a weekend. Video games that respect your time. I'm your host, Reagan Kelly, and I am joined by Shane Kelly, my bro. How are you doing, Shane? I'm doing great. I just got back from vacation. How was it? That was great. Took a little tour of New England. Found myself some uh, out-of-the-way record shops. That was fun. Uh, and, of course, Nate Heininger. How are you doing, Nate? Uh, I'm doing well. Freshly not vacationed. So, <laughs> normal. That sounds fresh. <laughs> nice. And we're, this week, this week we're talking about uh, something that's a bit different for the show. Um, so, actually, we, we were planning to talk about Quadrilateral Cowboy this week and uh, had to defer it a week uh, due to scheduling difficulties. It, it, it's a little on the longer side, not super long, but uh, we're still just kind of finishing it up, but uh, while looking around for something else to talk about this week, uh, I was playing some games on the old Sega Genesis, and beat Streets of Rage 2 for the probably 30th time in my life, and I thought, why don't we talk about this, because it's really short, and it's one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah, I gotta agree with you. Um, I wouldn't say it's one of my favorite games of all time, but it was definitely one of my favorite games of my childhood. And so it is kind of fun to bring that back and talk about it a little bit on the show. Um, I have beat it many times. Uh, it's one of the few games that I did beat when we were a kid, I think. We so a kid. That's the thing. When with we twins. were a we, kid. We were literally one. Yeah. <laughs> That's that was, how twins that was work, before right? the great separation. <laughs> when we were 13. Yeah, we 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 uh we we banged our head against this game a whole lot when we oh were Oh my kiddos. god, we really did. Yeah, that blows me away that you beat it a lot. Uh I hadn't beat it a lot as a kid, frankly. Like it was really hard back then, and now looking back on it, I don't find it particularly hard. That's kind of one of the reasons I thought it would be interesting to talk about on the show. We kind of try to talk about games that are short that you can dive into, experience, get something out of, um and and then move on feeling you've had a complete experience, uh, not games that take incredible amounts of time and frankly sometimes games that don't have an enormous uh skill barrier uh because if something takes a hundred hours of practice to get good at it then it doesn't really qualify as a short game even if a single run uh is is super short well we we've bent that rule a few times too that's actually true yeah we we pretty much just talk about what we like on this show and we like this game (laughs) um but it kind of fits the bill. If you're looking for a retro game that you can kind of tool around in a little bit and get a really great experience without having to invest an enormous amount of time learning systems, reading manuals, or, you know, walking your little dudes from uh, from town A to town B, like this is a really fast paced game that you can pick up and really understand and enjoy really quickly. I mean, it's called Streets of Rage. You don't really get more to the point than something like that. You pretty much are dropped in, uh, and you're fighting immediately, and you're not not fighting the entirety of the game. Yep, yeah, it uh, starts you on a street. <laughs> you're very angry. There's some angry people around you, yes. You're surrounded <laughs> would, by people who want to hurt you. Yep, so if you're not well, familiar, Streets of Rage is a uh, 2D beat em up uh, or beat them up uh, for the Sega Genesis. Uh, and if you're familiar with the beat them up genre, you're looking at, uh, you know, plowing through thousands of nameless, or in this case, perhaps not so nameless uh, dudes uh, left to right until you reach whatever boss is waiting for you. You beat them up and then you continue on to new bosses. And, uh, you know, it's uh, has a, a long history of these sorts of games. They all tend to be fairly simple in terms of mechanics. Now, there's good ones, there's boring ones. This is one that I think really shines for a few reasons. Um, it's uh, so it's from 1992, or very late 1992. This came out in December of 1992. So it's really almost more of... It came out after Christmas, which I think is a, uh, a weird decision uh, for a game to come out that late in the, uh, in the year. Um, but it's, uh, it's for the Sega Genesis and also has come out on innumerable platforms since then. I didn't do my research on this, but it, was it ever arcade? I have never seen it in the arcade, but a lot of the articles I was seeing said that there was an arcade version. Um, in Japan, it's called Bare Knuckle or Bare Knuckle 2. 
And so I think there may have been Japanese arcade versions of this, but okay. I, I have never seen Streets of Rage in an American arcade. Um, yeah, me neither. It just, I mean, it's built like all of the uh, beat 'em ups from the arcade time, you know, arcade days as well. There's a timer at the top. Um, you got minimum amount of lives. You're probably going to die a ton. Um, limited amount of continues. I just see it translating very well to me putting. Uh, an extreme amount of quarters into a machine to continue playing. Yeah, there's no saves. There's not even a password system. This is you boot up the cartridge and start from the beginning and play until you kick Mr. X in the face. Like, it's it's very, uh, very arcade style. Uh, each character has lots of different moves that they can do, and there's four characters with very distinct moves. And, of course, the characters are big and bright and colorful, and the levels are really elaborate so it's a it's a game that i thought at the time that it came out in the 90s uh was a really neat looking game with a lot of cool animation yeah i don't know how much that uh, translates to today's audiences i think in a lot of ways it stands up um it, so this came out in late 92 to kind of give that a, a place uh, we're talking about like roughly a year after the launch of the super nintendo um so the sega uh, team was sort of trying to push the limits of the then almost sort of aging Genesis to tr- kind of make it uh, stand out and look cool compared to some of the really interesting new stuff that was coming out on the Super Nintendo. Um, this is kind of a direct response to um, uh, what is it? A final fight, I think. Uh, there is there is not too long before this final fight, which is another beat 'em up that's very similar to Streets of Rage, uh, came out for the Super Nintendo. It was very popular. And this is kind of a response to that. So this is everything about the first Streets of Rage, but definitely more polished and kind of better looking, more characters. This was on a 16 meg cart, which was very, very large at the time. And so it was uh, it was standing out as a cool looking, cool sounding big game with lots of flashy graphics, a kind of a showpiece for the Genesis to kind of, you know, pull people back that might have been eyeing that Super Nintendo instead. Yeah, Final Fight was kind of a, an attempt, to, I guess, by Capcom to sort of convert your um, your Street Fighter uh, aesthetic into a beat 'em up, uh, which kind of kind of works. And it's kind of ironic that this game um, feels like it's going the other direction. So it's a sequel to Streets of Rage, which had this sort of uh, single player only campaign. But Streets of Rage Two actually tried to introduce a versus mode. Um, so those two games, the fighting game genre and the brawler genre, I think uh, have an interesting overlap with those two games. Yeah. Uh, I don't, don't bother with streets of rage twos versus mode, but it is a wonderful uh, beat em up. So there, there's four characters, which is another increase, you know, another thing that's uh, better than the first streets of rage, which I didn't really play very much of. We had that, I think, but I mostly played. Yeah, we had of both. Rage but two. Why would you play one when you had streets of rage two? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Returning from the first game are Axel and Blaze. Uh, Axel is generic white dude. And Blaze is a stoner who has a big doobie that she lights and uses to fight enemies. Uh, that would have been an interesting choice, but no. She's, uh, she's the healthiest with 420 hit points. That's so. I did not realize that. Um, that, was a, that was a joke. Sorry. Oh. I'm going to go back and edit that you, you, out. You didn't get that? You didn't no. get that joke? No, I didn't pick up on that. I didn't yeah. pick up on that. I'm editing it's that out so I'm I don't sound funny. like such an idiot. Yeah, Blaze is my main in this game because she is just sort of all around good. Uh, and she has, uh, all of the characters have a uh, have a sort of back attack. If you hit B and C together, that'll uh, help kind of clear if you are getting people coming up behind you. But Blaze's back attack also hits to the front, although it doesn't have very much range to the front. It's kind of a leg sweep. So I tend to go with her because I get uh, I tend to get surrounded a lot, and then um, Blaze can can get out of those situations really easily. But the other two characters are very different. Um, Max is gigantic. He's the sort of huge muscle-bound Hulk of the game. Very powerful, but shorter range and uh, not much jumping ability and slower movement. And Skate. And Skate is the, like, this game is 90s as hell, and Skate is, like, the, the most 90s thing about it. Skate is a young black kid in on rollerblades who does hip-hop moves as his dance uh, fighting thing people always want to try and people always wanted to combine uh dance and fighting in the 90s 
or or gymnastics and fighting. You get your gym kata uh, type type elements. I think that's kind of uh, kind of Blaze had that that gym kata element to her. You do kind of get a feeling that uh, that a lot of the character design in this is American crime movie or action movie seen through a Japanese lens. All American men wear boxing gloves. Exactly. And the <laughs> the inner cities are crawling with uh, brightly colored gang members with uh, with also lots and lots of completely identical dudes. So it's it's very uh, it's very arcadey but very th- the style will scream 90s to you from 100 miles away. In a good way, like I find it very charming now. We're at, we're at a period now where I look back at the '90s with more uh, amusement and fondness than pity. <laughs> than pity. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, it's normal to uh, walk into a room, a park bench where there's like a guy wearing like gym, like a speedo, a funny hat, and he's asleep on the. Uh, park bench, and when you walk by, he's up and ready to fight. And you might walk <laughs> across like twelve of these dudes through one park. They're just all sleeping on park benches. Well, of course, they're all part of a syndicate. Uh, the game has a story, as such. Uh, if you watch the title crawl at the beginning, and of course, it's it's part of a deep continuity because it's the sequel to Streets of Rage One. Uh, Mister X, who was vanquished at the end of Streets of Rage One, turns out he's not dead. Actually, let me uh, let me just read the text from the the title crawl. One year after the battle, and you see a photo that is presumably from the end of Streets of Rage 1. The city that had been plagued with crime and violence was safe and peaceful. And then you see uh, above the city the evil specter of giant purple Mr. X. And there's some scrolling text. However, evil has once again cast its shadow over the city. Mr. X, the syndicate crime boss, believed destroyed by the three young vigilantes, has come back to life stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Thirsty for revenge, he kidnaps Adam in an attempt to lure Axel and Blaze into a trap. That's their explanation, I suppose, for why Adam from the first game doesn't make a return appearance. Good, because I was wondering. Uh, Axel and Blaze set out to help their faithful companion, joined by Axel's friend Max, a wrestler, and Adam's kid brother, Skate. Um, They're determined to save Adam and put Mr. X out of action. Young friends, rage burning inside them, make a stand for friendship and peace. So... That's our continuity. We are fighting the Syndicate and Mr. X across the many stages of the Metropolis. And uh, the stages are pretty diverse. And um, I think that's one of the, the highlights of the game is just that the, the settings for each level are really interesting, colorful settings. They're not all just dingy back alleys like you might expect from a game like this. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of incorporation of of up and down movement whereas a lot of brawlers uh, are mostly just scrolling left to right here you're scrolling 90 percent left to right and then there's that little moment where you have to go down in order to <laughs> continue right uh and uh like your first your first uh, area which is called downtown um is just sort of a uh dingy street just like you're saying uh full of i guess cyber goth muggers <laughs> and uh yeah you're fighting your way through uh, this sort of bar district with with bars that have uh charming neon signs that say things like dunk or <laughs> uh bar actually i i think the thing that really stands out in this first level is just the color scheme like they really uh it feels almost kind of blade runnery to me there's all these purples and greens in the pavement and the walls uh, in a way that like really looks like they have a they have a specific aesthetic in mind. Like they weren't just going for grays and browns and blacks. It's really a colorful uh, street scene. Um, it's also where you obviously being the first level, you get your first taste of the soundtrack, which is freaking amazing. We haven't talked about it yet. Oh my gosh, the soundtrack to this game is probably today my favorite thing about it. I I I I played it in in its era, and I liked. I liked the soundtrack at the time, but I wasn't someone who thought a lot about 
video game music. Also, do you um, remember what we played this on? Because like you, you, you couldn't possibly have picked something that would make it sound worse. We were playing it on a Model 1 Sega Genesis with a slightly broken jack over RF on a tiny mono uh, television that was maybe like uh, five inches across. So, and you know, one tiny awful speaker. So pretty hard to appreciate the finer points of the art and music uh, in the setup we were using back then. That sounds about the standard Sega Genesis experience. Was that not what they were uh, going for with this stuff? <laughs> well, if you play the it today, is so you get a little much better, better today. Experience. Yes, if you if you experience it today, you're hearing the intricacies of the tone uh, that you never would have heard in, in the uh, in the in the days of uh, crappy built-in speakers on my tiny 9-inch CRT. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this soundtrack is fantastic. It's by Yuzo Koshiro. Yes. Um, I'm not really an expert on like his uh, biography or anything like that, but uh, he's he was responsible for a lot of pretty influential uh, soundtracks, particularly for Sega, but but some others. And yeah, so I think he was involved in um, a soundtrack for Kid Icarus. I think he was involved in a bunch of different... Um, other act raiser, RPGs, apparently, according to yeah. his uh, bio here. Um, so he's a really big name in uh, in chiptune. Uh, he was uh, sort of an early pioneer with FM synthesis, and the the Genesis has a really good sound chip or you know sound synthesis uh, setup, uh, or at least it compared really well with a lot of the other stuff that was coming out at the time. Um, and really, it's on display here. This is one of the best soundtracks on the Sega Genesis. Uh, it, it sounds really different than the stuff you'd hear in a lot of other games. Like, even games that have really good soundtracks, like Sonic 2, Sonic 3, um, have a very, very different sound than this. These are really long tracks um, with a lot of variety within them. So we're talking about tracks that don't loop for two, sometimes three minutes, which is really long in this kind of thing. And yeah, they absolutely. sound like uh, like the sort of thing you'd hear in a, in a bar or it, it has this sort of very electronic dance music kind of feel to it. Yeah, it's, it's got a dance, like hard techno type feel to it. Uh, it was apparently arranged using an NEC PC 8801 computer. And a custom personalized version of BASIC uh, that this guy used called Music Macro Language, which is just adorably cool. 90s. Uh, but the way I'm listening to it today um, is from an incredible final release that it just got uh, by a group of musicians and, well, I guess, I don't know if you really call people who remaster old stuff musicians. Uh, but Whoa, it's a group shots fired. in, uh, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, okay. I didn't didn't mean to step on that one. I'm sorry, Nate. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, th these guys in London called Data have been doing official licensed releases of old, mainly old Sega titles. And I this was the first one that I got as a gift from Reagan. Thank you so much because he knows how much uh, I love this game, and he also knows that I'm a uh, big fan of vinyl records. I don't know what uh, it's my other hobby outside of video games. I don't know uh, if you guys and I have talked about that much. Uh, I don't know what it was that drew me to it first. Was it the expense? Was it the clutter that it introduces into my life? <laughs> Is it uh, the uh, decreased audio quality over MP3? Uh, I, maybe it's all of the above. Um, <laughs> but uh, the release from data is a beautiful object just in in terms of uh, just sort of a loving production uh, and i've gone on to pick up several other uh releases from from the the this group data they did streets of rage one and two and so now i have both of those of course um and i also have their super hang on which do you guys remember super hang on yes also excellent the, yeah that one's a real arcade extravaganza where you actually you can when you play that record you feel the plastic motorcycle between your legs. Um, <laughs> Do you want that? Is that a thing that you? I I almost bought. So I I, uh, I bought you this um, 
this this uh, this vinyl record and and uh, you know it shipped to me before I passed it on to you as a gift and I almost kept it because it is such a gorgeous thing so uh, or maybe it's just the nostalgia talking but I love this thing so um, if you're a fan it of totally this game is. you should totally pick up the record it almost made me buy a record player just so I could keep this and not give it to you but it's a fantastic soundtrack um, and they did a wonderful job of preserving it and. Um, and re- sort of remastering it, making it sound its best and look its best. Um, so it's it's a well-respected soundtrack, even outside of the context of the game itself. Um, but to go back to talking about the game itself, uh, the first level, Downtown, is fantastic. It's a great way to set up all everything that's going on in the game. Beautiful art. There's a mid-boss that I like a lot, this lady with a whip, um, Electra, obviously. <laughs> uh, because what else would you name a lady with an electric whip? And uh, then the final boss of the of the level is Barbon, who is this big mustachioed guy wearing kind of like uh, drawstring pants. I guess he's uh, he's a little bland, but it's uh, it's a good overall level. Yeah, it's a good introduction to the game. I mean, I think you can probably, if even if you've never played, pick it up and and beat the first stage without uh, dying maybe more than once. Um, is electric can be a little bit difficult um, if you can't get kind of like a rounder, and if you have the standard problems like I did picking this up after a long time, uh, like lining your player up on the line to where you're not just sitting like seemingly a half a centimeter above the thing you're trying to punch and just kind of punching nothing while it sits right below you punching nothing yeah. until you can kind of inch down and get on the right line. That is definitely one of the annoyances of this game, and there's a few. You know, it, as a, it, it's a little hard to do that kind of lineup. Also, some of the moves are really hard to execute. Um, I mostly play with, um, uh, oh geez, what's her name again? Uh, Blaze. Blaze. Thank you. I mostly play with Blaze, and she has. The, none of the characters have a ton of moves, but you only have three buttons on the Sega controller. Um, and so you're pretty limited in what you can do. And most of the moves involve like double taps of direction buttons in a particular button or pressing multiple buttons at once. So some of the moves are a little hard to pull off. Um, not to mention just kind of hard to remember. Um, I, I, I never remember how to break out of a, uh, of a, of a hold or put somebody in one apart from Into a, it just kind of, it just, just happens wham on the a button a bunch just yeah. keep yeah. on wham that's how um, i get to the entire game oh man if you're whamming on the a button a bunch you're gonna screw yourself because actually you can almost play this with two buttons the the a button uh is your special but the special depletes your health when you use it and so you really try not to use it very much you have just a one health meter and if you do the special attack it will, you know, it does a relatively large amount of damage, but it almost never really feels like it's the right choice to be using that, except in the direst circumstances. So, or if you can hit like six of them at the same time. With that it. said, this is a game where the garbage cans are full of delicious turkey dinners. Yes, that, that's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I know kind of blew me away about this game when I was a kid was the uh, interaction with the environment so to speak, as well as the weapons. Mm. And both of those are introduced in the first level. And I don't know, there's something sickly and incredibly satisfying about the the like jab that your character does with the knife mm. and your ability to like you can pivot, you know, 180 degrees the moment you press the button left and right. So you can just like fla, 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 bounce it back and forth, just stabbing like you know, because the screen will get like five or six guys. They all gang up on you and just pop back and forth, just sticking out this silly little like eight pixels of white knife at the end of your hand. And it does a ton of damage and it's super satisfying. Yeah, actually, all the weapons in this are pretty satisfying, but there's really not very many of them. There's the uh, there's the uh, the knife, uh, which is a little bit faster than your punch and it does a little bit more damage and you can throw it. There's a pipe that. It has a little more reach than your kicks or punches, and also you can throw it, and it's a little more powerful, but it's relatively slow. Um, there's a samurai sword and a sort of samurai knife, I guess. It's like a little ninja like a knife. a fat knife. Yeah, a yeah. little fat knife. <laughs> yeah. 
And I think that may be it. I'm not remembering any <laughs> others. Samurai sword all the way. Yeah, samurai sword's the best one for sure. Yes, but but if you drop them, they will lie on the ground. And if you drop the pick them up and drop them a second time, they vanish. So it's pretty hard to kind of carry one of those with you the whole way through the game. Um, mostly, I found myself just picking them up, using them to clear the screen, and then throwing them at the nearest person. Yeah, and if you um, most of the levels, maybe a few screens that you're kind of following your character from left to right through, but there's a lot of cuts. You go through a door or it, you know, you kind of go through one way. And if you're carrying an item, when you cut to that other side, it goes away too. Yeah. So they are very, very short lived and it's best to just use them well on as many dudes as you can and then expect to lose them. And the bad guys can pick them up too. So it's uh, helpful to get them even just to get them out of the hands of the bad guys too. Yeah, you know, they started strong with the first level, but the second level I always hated. The motorcycle guys, right? Yeah, it's the bridge. <laughs> a bridge under construction. This is the this is the most bog standard level when it comes to brawlers. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty boring looking compared to downtown. It's really kind of just gray and not particularly exciting. But there is a really good bit near the end. Um, the bridge, you're uh, you're being assaulted by dudes on motorcycles. Yeah, they look like a, a, a biker gang that was inspired by like. The, what's that guy, the hunter that fought Spider-Man? I think they look sort of like the Predator. I think they look sort of like losers. Yeah, yeah, they're jerks. Actually, something that I really think is interesting about these, by the way, is as you're fighting these, like they have the same sprites again and again and again. There's really only one sprite for the biker gang, for example. They have some mm -hmm. various color variations. So like there's the yellow biker gang guy and the green biker gang guy. But every time you fight one of these, you get a health bar for them and it shows their name. And one of my favorite things about this is that almost every individual enemy that you fight in the game has a unique name. And uh, enemies of the same type uh, often have names that are kind of organized around a theme. So, for example, the biker gang guys, uh, they all have names that are named after different types of weather. Like fog, yeah. hail, mist, dew, gale, tempest, tornado, blade. I guess blade isn't weather. But anyway, mostly they're weather. <laughs> Do you think Gale got made fun of uh, yeah. <laughs> among everyone else? I mean, that like that's just also a normal lady name. He he probably had something to prove. Actually, you can't really tell under his uh, under his armor he might be a lady. You know, maybe yeah. there maybe there's more gender diversity in this biker gang than. Well, we I'm think. not saying it's it's an insult that it's a lady name. I'm just saying it's they all have like super intense names, and it's like <laughs> Storm, Lightning, Deborah, <laughs> Tempest. <laughs> Tempest, yeah. Yeah. This is also where we start seeing ninjas, um, which, you know, at first you think, oh, I'm just fighting a bunch of uh, tough guys, but actually, no, ninjas, mm -hmm. because you can't have a game that comes from a Japanese developer without having to fight some ninjas. And uh, they all have you know, Japanese names, uh, or at least I assume they are, um, like Suzuka and Seriku and so on. Um, but they're, yeah. they're tough, but... They're also really easy to put into a pattern. Um, so, like, they take a lot more hits than the biker gang guys do. But uh, if you can get them alone so that you're not being hit from behind, uh, they're not too hard to take out. The thing that always bothered me the most in this level was Jet. Oh, my God. Who is basically a limp-wristed rocketeer. I hate this guy. And uh, the thing that annoys me the most about this level, just sort of overall, was the fact that uh, I never saw a single ramp and yet these motorbikes that the motorbike guys are on, they're flying all over the screen. And <laughs> Jet, Jet comes in, and he's flying all over the screen. And you have to you have to knock him down. And in a game where, like, your vertical positioning on the screen has to be, like, pixel perfect, like, it's very clear that these are 2D guys who, like, a millimeter out of place, and he'll just punch right behind the guy's head, like, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. Like and meanwhile, Jet is flying down like uh, like a low rent rocketeer trying to crash your party. He does these dive bombs that are very annoying. Um, he, 
I, I pretty much have never found a good strategy for Jet. Uh, I pretty much just have to stand there doing jump kick after jump kick after jump kick, hoping that they connect if he, you know, tries to come towards me while I happen to be jump kicking. And I pretty much always lose a life to Jet at this point in the uh, in the game because it, it, there's just no other way around him. He, you just have to jump kick until eventually he dies. Which also, coincidentally, jump kick until they die is really a sound strategy in just about every beat em up from this era. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. A game that comes to mind that I played a lot of, uh, even though I also was a Sega Genesis kid, was the uh, Turtles in Time. Mm. Um, you know, a really, really, really famous beat em up from that era. Um, and super good, too, jump- actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. And you could just jump kick like that whole game. From the start to yeah. finish, I think you could beat with only <laughs> jump kicks. I, you know, you can you can slide kick your way through most of this game as well. The the slide kick is a pretty uh, indomitable move, um, and neither of those two moves I think really translate well into the real world. Like if you got into a fight and you tried to like do a standing slide kick followed <laughs> by a standing jump kick, you've just played yourself. Yeah, <laughs> a, a jump kick in general, I don't think is a thing that real people in the real world can well easily pull it, off it turns out we can't jump straight up and then at the peak of our jump fly forward with a karate kick that you know you, and they're jumping about eight feet in the air and then forward another eight so if you could do that in real life it would be a great move in a fight <laughs> but our unexpected uh, our simple human jump kicks are terrible, especially when you're like me and you can hardly lift your leg like above your waist. So I can't really kick anyone anyway. I tend to make my way through most <laughs> of this game with a lot of uh, of Blaze's vertical slash, which is a forward, forward B. And if you do that, she does a kind of a spin in the air. Uh, and it it's not a special move, so it doesn't deplete your meter, but it kind of acts like one. It's a, it's a pretty... Uh, pretty monster move and it'll take out people both in front of and behind you Um, and also her sweep kick which if you hold you press b and c together she'll do a kind of a a, like circular sweep kick Um, with a combination of those plus just regular punches and kicks uh, you can usually get through most of this game without too much trouble i think she's kind of the easy mode for this actually yeah i I like max a lot Uh, i think I would go with him because he has just a lot of, uh, what do you say? Uh, he got the uh, muscles. Oh, no, wait, uh, Max. He's just I'm got sure a lot of muscles. One, but I'm thinking of Axel, yeah. You're right. And, Max is uh, huge. Max is big. Uh, and since I only really use one button when I'm playing this, it doesn't matter who I, who I pick. <laughs> um, Max has got a, 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 a nice, gra- I don't know, I think all the characters can do it. It's like the where you, you grab an enemy and you like punch him a couple of times and you like flip him over your shoulder. Oh yeah, the wrestling move thing. I don't know what that's called, yeah. but it's uh I think yeah, all the I characters don't know. can do it, which makes it's it particularly effective. funny to see some of the smaller characters like Blaze pull that off on the incredibly large characters like Barbon. Yeah, but we're we're running through the uh through the levels, right? So level yeah. 3 is my favorite, the, the amusement park. Yeah, the amusement park. It's it's absolutely the tops. Like you start this one off in a classic amusement park kind of setting, but it's nighttime. There's uh, color changing lights, really cool. This is where we first see the uh, hobos sleeping on the benches that you have to kill. Um, Nate, I never thank you for pointing that out. I never really, really thought about the fact that these guys were clearly homeless. <laughs> um, and then you go inside of some kind of glowing. A rock structure, I guess, and then you find yourself on a pirate ship. Yeah, which is you, know, awesome. you go first into an arcade. So I, when I was a kid, I actually was kind of confused about what this level was all about. Um, and I, as an adult, I see, I, I think I sort of made more sense of it. I, I don't know why it was so confusing to me as a child. I was like, why are we on a pirate ship? I don't understand. But no, you're you're actually in a kind of a haunted house type of exhibit within the amusement park. So you first go into an arcade building, and then inside the arcade building, there's a sign that says pirates, and you go into the pirates room, and <laughs> then you're on a pirate ship. And you kill your way through the pirate ship full of ninjas, and then you're back in another arcade area, and then you're in the aliens-themed room, um, where apparently they've rigged up I guess, a real alien monster that you have to fight as a boss. Um, did you catch the name of the arcade games that all the guys are playing when you <laughs> storm in there? Yes, um, they're Bare Knuckle 2. Yep, the Japanese name of the game. 
Yep, which is great. And there's actually also ads for like Bear Two in the uh, in the stadium level later on. So it's very self referential. Yeah, I think okay. So you fight Electra here again, right? But yeah. also there's no, there's like double Electra. Yeah. There's like double Electra and a Jack, the guy with the knives. So like they gang yes. up on you at the entrance altogether. Uh, this is something mm. that the game does a lot where it'll give you something as a boss or a mid boss. And then later on, give you the same thing with a different name, maybe a different color scheme. But now they're in groups. So um, it really, really builds like on Jack as, a, as an enemy because he has an unlimited supply of knives and he'll pull out a knife. And if you can hit him, he'll drop it and then you can like grab it and throw it at him. Yeah, that's, that's fun. fun. Um, one thing that I forgot to bring up, I believe it's in the second level, so I don't want to get too far from it, and it's really, really cool, and it, it stood out to me even on this replay for this. Um, you walk into a room, and there's a guy who, like, he's more in the foreground, and he, like, rips off his shirt, and he's ready to fight you, and in the background, there's a there's a bunch of guys, um, five or six of them all with, like, weapons, and they're all chanting in the background, similar to what you would see in, you know, Street Fighter or something like that, like an arena. But as soon as you kill the uh, the guy who like challenges you, all the guys from the background with the weapons all rush the stage, and you have to kill all of them too. Hmm. And I just love that so much. It it, it, it kind of twists what your expectations. Like I was really thinking, like, oh, I'm just gonna fight this guy and then I'll move past, and then they all spring and you have to kill all of them. It was really clever. Mm-hmm. It does a few things like that. I think the um, the stadium level, which is next, has a really fun bit with a fighting ring where you have to fight a guy that's like a uh, like a pro wrestler type. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also a great crowd in the background there. Um, so lots of great, great sort of crowd stuff, uh, which is pretty hard in this era. Um, the last thing I want to mention about the amusement park before we move off of it is that the boss is really fun, but also a huge ripoff. Uh, it's Zamza. Uh, Zamza is basically Blanca from Street Fighter. He looks exactly like <laughs> Blanca from Street Fighter. His moves are basically exactly like Blanca from Street Fighter. He has this sort of like long fingernails and spiky hair. So yeah, um, he's total ripoff, but he's fun here. He's really, really brutal though. You have to use special attacks on him pretty much. Uh, otherwise he will just keep uh, flying around at you. Yeah, and you fight him in the uh, HR Giger exhibit at the arcade. Yep. And it's pretty fun. Like, how did they, uh, how did they, that, that's the thing that's probably the biggest mystery to me story-wise here is like, okay, I get it. We go through a pirate's exhibit. That makes some sense. I've been to Disney World. But then we're in the aliens thing, and there's like a literal alien monster head that attacks you, plus a hideous freak with giant fingernails. Like, what kind of syndicate, crime syndicate are they running around here? Uh, it's the mutants and muggers group. <laughs> And we make our way past them, finally, into the stadium, uh, the next level, uh, which is, okay, um, you know, I kind of like the baseball stadium setting because it's it's kind of attractive. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a familiar looking setting and it, the, the colors are nice, but I like one thing here um, in this in this level. The thing I liked the best or sometimes it's hard for me to say things about this game that I love without saying that I also hate them with a passion. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> there are, there is an enemy here who, uh, it's just like, they look a lot like the ordinary street gang type guys, uh, but they've wised up and they just sort of have a knife and they hold it like chest level. Oh my right God, those guys. And they just sort of walk across the, str- <laughs> the screen, you know, just trying to get you. Um, and you can always hear them I kind just, of holding their knife going, yeah. here, here I go. <laughs> yeah, they just, yeah, it's, Coming and they're through. so obnoxious, but it really is. It's a, they're it's a very good tactic. <laughs> yeah, you, they really, they really figured out like, oh, hey, th- th- this guy's really bad at figuring out spatially whether he's towards the back or front of the room. Let me just walk across with my knife out. It'll be perfect. Yeah. And hey, it here works. I come. There I go. Um, they, they are really funny. You have to do a jump kick on them. Otherwise, they will knife you in the face. Um, my other favorite. No, they'll, they'll knife you in the abdomen. Abs- they, they don't vary up or down at all. <laughs> Low abdomen. They hold it right to their own chest. I just love that there's, here we go. No mo- there's no momentum loss when they do stab you. It's just a clean pass right through you. You go flying backwards, and they're just nope, off the screen. And they, they are really right funny. Back. <laughs> yeah, and then we get into the baseball stadium, fight a couple of Electras. Yeah. Well, don't forget Anything about else? the best thing in the baseball stadium, which is the super fat guys that leap onto you. Um, 
these guys are called Big Ben, and there's other versions of him as well. Um, Big Ben is just a giant, fat guy. I actually, when I was a kid, fire. I thought, and I still think it's possible, that these guys are specifically a call-out of Mario. Um, because it's a big, fat dude in a in red pants and a red hat that looks vaguely like a Mario hat. I don't know, like a white t-shirt with suspenders. And he's just sort of got a Mario vibe to me if you were making like a like a mean-spirited parody of Mario. Maybe that's why he breathes fire. Maybe because he has the fire flower. Yeah, actually. I never he, thought about and that. And also he jumps on you as his main attack. So, huh. yeah, that's my theory here. I don't have anything to back that up. But I really think that like this is a Sega kid, a, like mean-spirited, like Mario parody kind of thing. Um, they may have been doing something kind of similar with Zamza, but that was less of a parody than a straight ripoff. Well, Reagan, you know, I don't I don't have any better explanation for why this gang would have as one of their top guys in the baseball crime um, department, uh, a big fat man child who breathes fire. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I would I would at least argue that. There's the stereotype of like the the Babe Ruth baseball player who's like just a big fat dude who like doesn't really take care of himself, but he can hit a ball real hard. So well, why wouldn't you know, he hit you with a bat or wear a baseball hat? Why the why good, the little me, like I don't know. He's wearing a. It's, he's you wearing are a the baseball expert here. Do baseball players have the ability to breathe fire? Well, yeah. Duh. Man. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> okay, that's, I, that's I, how you hit a home run. But actually, side sidebar question about about this. So you bring that up, and that is kind of a, a stereotype that you see is like the. But where are all the fat baseball players today, Nate? Well, are there it still face fat baseball. It's because sports are like so extreme now, and everyone is this like crazy tuned. Uh, actually, no. Look up. Okay, there's a guy named Prince Fielder, or David Ortiz, or Bartolo Colon. There are current active baseball players who are just big fat dudes, and so <laughs> I. I love the Mario thing. Um, I, I like it, but you know, if we're going off of the like, you know, it this is Americans uh, from the view of uh, Japanese. It could just be making fun of like big fat baseball players. Yeah, or big still, fat big fat Americans in general, possibly. Yeah, they still exist, big fat baseball players. For the most part, though, everyone's like, it's like crazy, like muscle machine guys. But especially in the past, it was way more big fat dudes who played baseball. The other thing that happens in this level is once you get to the center of the uh, baseball stadium and you fight off the Big Ben, um, the center of the baseball diamond turns out is an elevator and you spend several minutes kind of descending in this elevator uh, as various different dudes jump down onto the elevator platform from above and attack you. It's uh, it's a kind of a fun uh, part as once you figure out that you can avoid being landed on. I was always, as a kid, the, the dudes falling down from the top would always land on me, and I hadn't picked up on the fact that they cast a shadow before they do that, and it was always like a really cheap kill, because it seemed like every single one of them would land on me, and then I'd get crushed and lose like two lives on the way down to the, uh, the, the, the elevator. Very annoying, but yeah, now it's not so hard once you know to look for the, the, um, the shadows. Once you get to the bottom, you f- uh, you're in a kind of underground... A wrestling ring with a crowd around it, and you fight the boss, which is Ab- Abadid, Abadidi, and he's just sort of a big pro wrestler guy. Um, he has this sort of running punch that he does that's hard to block, but you got to do some more jumping kicks, jump and kick. That's where it's at. That he's jump got kick. kind of a uh, offensive Native American type look to him, <laughs> like stereotype, or I don't know. He's, so that's not the that's not the vibe I got off of him, but looks like he's got some feathers in his hair or something to me. <laughs> uh, You're he right; it's kind of hard to tell by the size of the tiny guy. Yeah, and he's got a kind of a face stripe that it's hard to tell whether they're going for like face paint or what. But yeah, he, he's a, he's just a big muscle bound dude wearing little tiny red uh, speedo. And you beat him up and you win. Yep, he's the boss. You kill him, you move on. 
Um, the the next level was uh, the ship, and this was one of the. This is where I usually died when I was playing this as a kid. Like no matter how hard I tried, I really couldn't get past uh, the ship. Um, and it's because there's some pretty That's- tough. Uh, fighters here. Uh, there's some. You start getting these boxer characters, these kickboxers, and uh, the kickboxers are uh, they're better at blocking you than any of the other characters you've seen so far. Like most mm-hmm. of the other characters, you can kind of get them into a pattern, but these guys have a block that pretty much just completely blocks you unless you trip them up first. Um, I didn't really know that as a kid, and I would lo- lose a lot of lives to these guys, and eventually, usually get uh, get knocked out somewhere around this level. Uh, there's not a lot to say about this. You're moving your way through a uh, through a ship, um, like not even like an interesting looking ship. It's all just sort of gray decks and corridors, bland looking cargo decks mm-hmm. and stuff. And then to add insult to injury, when you get on the deck of the ship, two more of those jet guys show up. Oh God, I forgot about that. Yeah. Oh, at two at a time. And then the boss is this enormous, uh, kind of creepy looking boxer character. So. Uh, not a kickboxer, but like a, another big fat guy, a big bald. Uh, his, his name is R. Bear, <laughs> which I think is a like. I R had a real hard R time with R. Bear. Bear. It yeah. is R. Yeah. Ruxpin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <that's>, Ruxpin <laughs> Bear. <laughs> that's got to be it. Ruxpin. And yeah, uh, yeah. he's he's mean and a good boxer and huge and very difficult to beat. Um, but uh there's, again, not a whole lot of specific strategy here. We're going we to just... stop for a moment. Nate is sending me some beautiful pictures of fat baseball players. <laughs> so I'm glad to know that the tradition is alive and well. These guys are very fat. Oh, yeah. Wow. This last guy, he's a... Uh, Who, yeah. Who's number one there? Because he is, he, is he is a man. <laughs> That's Bartolo Colon. Hey, Bartolo. <laughs> he, he's uh, like 42, 42 years old and still pitching in the majors. Right. Way to go, awesome. dude. There was actually is... a record set. Um, I, I forget he, w- he was pitching to, but he, he the, the him and the, the catcher he was pitching to set the record in baseball for the most combined weight between a pitcher and a catcher. <laughs> <laughs> I love that someone worked out the stats for that. Dude, it's baseball. There's a stat for everything. Somebody yeah, that's what tracking. they call <laughs> um, that's sabermetrics. Uh, money ball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, once you get through the ship, you're in the jungle level. Uh, I think we can probably speed through the last few of these. Uh, the jungle level is uh, Mr. X's Island. So presumably you've made uh-huh. your way out of the inner city Uh, across the ocean to the island where the syndicate runs things from. Why they don't have their base in the city that they're crime lords of, I will never know, but ruled from afar. You're now in the jungle, and uh, it's a pretty short level. Um, The boss is... Beach ninjas. Yeah, beach ninjas. Jungle ninjas. It's a decent level, but it's really short. It breezes right by, and then you go to the munitions plant. This is probably the most video gamey level. Like, if you have a, a level that isn't kind of a robot factory in your video game, I don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> Just in general, every yep. game. Yeah. The robot factory in Gone Home was very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that you're fighting these robots. Like, I, I wasn't, ex- you know, you, never, you don't expect to fight robots in this game, but suddenly you're you're fighting these uh, these sort of like sentry robots. These. Uh, they've got the kind of like weird backward bending legs and the little robot head with a laser he- laser eye in the middle. Yeah, and you're, you've got you get a scene on one of those classic sideways elevators that exist in anime, but not in real life. Yeah, what is the deal with that? I've never really figured that out. That like, are those all reference? The first place I ever saw that was in Akira. But are they all references yeah, to Akira? Yeah, the, the first place I saw it too. I've literally never seen. So what we're talking about there is like. Uh, in in the anime, elevator basically. platforms that go diagonal. Yeah, the huge room-sized diagonally descending elevator platforms. They only show up in video games. Like I remember, like Zone of the Enders was lousy with them, um, and in anime. And I have literally never seen anything like that in reality. Wow, this place is lousy with Wonkavators. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the Sentry robots also have cool names like Particle, Molecule, Isotope, Uranium, and so on. Um, and uh, they have lasers, uh, which I think is the f- well. I think no, their the main first... weapon is like they have they have. Uh... Uh, ball and chain, spiky oh, ball yes. and chains for their arms. Yeah, which yeah, is pretty which cool. Is awesome. <laughs> and they have kangaroo legs. I think they have the first 
apart from the uh, thrown weapons like the um, uh, like the knives, I think this is the first ranged stuff you have to face off with. And you'd really think that Mr. X could afford guns for his his crews, but no, like really no guns, but suddenly sentry robots with chain arms. No, but Reagan, guns are illegal. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Um, so finally we make it through the, uh, the munitions plant and we make it to the final level, which is the Syndicate Stronghold. And once again, you have another elevator and it's a boss rush. You have to fight basically all the bosses that you've fought across the, uh, the game. Um, Mr. X is like, so setting the scene for the final confrontation, maybe my favorite screen in the game, in a game full of beautiful scenery. Uh, you are in a beautiful penthouse or type or, you know, top floor office. Uh, Mr. X, the most 90s or maybe 80s of evil stereotypes you've ever seen. A giant man in a suit, bright red tie, huge mullet, mustache, and enormous Tommy gun sitting in a giant chair with giant uh, antler deer heads on the wall behind him and a sun slowly setting in the distance. And then you have to fight his bodyguard first, Shiva, uh, who's just another ninja, but like a really mean ninja. Fire kicks this ninja. Yeah, he is. Yep. He is a bear. Um, but if I you can thought, defeat I him, I thought Shiva was a girl because he's got kind of some well-developed pecs there. Um, that's an excellent question. No, what am I talking about? There's the uh, there's the Electras. Um, I was about to say I don't think you fight any girls in this, but uh, you're right. I think that maybe Shiva is a girl, but uh, oh. it's never, never. Well, you don't, you don't get to know what Shiva's preferred pronouns are. Um, <laughs> and there's Gale. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. X though is great. Uh, so he's the only guy in the whole crew who has a gun. That's why he's on top. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and he's he just sort of. He stands in the background while uh, various mobs of other dudes try to attack you and occasionally tries to shoot you with his Tommy gun. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, he's not hard to kill, uh, but you have to stay out of the way of his uh, his Tommy gun fire. But once you take him out, you've saved the day, you've rescued your friend Alex, and uh, you leave on a helicopter to go back to the city that you have now presumably killed all of the bad people in. And that's it. That is... Streets of Rage 2. Yeah, man. Put put in your three initials. You won. So the game has a few different difficulty modes. Like if you want to replay it, you know, there's no branching paths or anything. It's those eight levels in that order. Uh, you can tune how many lives you get. You always get three continues, but there's some cheats you can use to increase that number. Um, so if you want to just breeze through this, like if you find it difficult to the point of frustration, first off, you can turn up the, uh, the number of lives that you get from, I think, three per continue to five per continue. Or yeah, from if, uh, from not enough to barely enough. Yeah. Or if you want, uh, there's a special thing you can do by I think you have to plug in a second controller and hold down some buttons. Maybe just do a Google search and find the game facts. But there's something you can do with a second controller that lets you go in and uh, adjust the number of continues you get, as well as up the number of lives per continue you get to nine. So that would theoretically give you as many as something like 25 or 30 lives. Uh, which is enough to get through this game in one go, even if you're only moderately okay at it. Also, the difficulty levels are uh, pretty flexible. Uh, by default, you have like easy, sort of easy, medium or normal, sort of hard and very hard. And uh, if you've completed the game once, they tell you a code that lets you unlock a very hard or like maniac or something like that difficulty mode. So um, if you want, you can abuse yourself in that way. Anything else we want to say about this game? I, I think we've given it our our uh, full workup. I played it using Open EMU, um, and there are an insane amount of cheat codes and like mods. Basically, I think people have made for it that all go through cheat codes as Open EMU. They give you a ton of different options on yeah, how to play of, it. Yeah, a lot of game genie codes and patches and so on. So yeah. if you uh, if you want to re you know make the game easier for yourself, there's many ways to do it. Um, but it really doesn't take that much. Um, and y you know if you don't make it all the way to uh, 
like if you're playing this just to, to uh, find something to, to explore it for a little while uh, and you don't want to cheat, you, you can on the totally default standard normal difficulty, you can get through most of this game even if you're not an uber gamer. It's not terribly hard. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a lot of fun to, uh, uh, to try it that way first. So where can people get this game? Yeah, you can pick this game up uh, in a few different ways now. Uh, I would say the best way to do it is just to uh, try and go to the... I'm a record enthusiast, so uh, I love inconvenient, expensive ways to do things. Uh, So buy a Genesis uh, on eBay uh, and then find this game on eBay uh, and play it that way. But you can also also find the game on Steam now uh, if you are not into the whole... Uh, expensive a uh, hobby sort of way of doing things um, you can download a ROM I'm not going to tell you where to do that just you probably can um, and it's even out on the 3DS uh, on their sort of 3D classics I guess that the eShop type thing and uh, you could download and play it there yeah the Steam version is only three bucks it's a Windows only download which is a little annoying but Steam has or uh, Sega has been doing a really nice job with making their Genesis classics available through Steam Um, and they give you a really nice presentation so if that's something that's valuable to you and you're playing on Windows um, I would do that give them three bucks for this This is a great game and uh, the 3D classics version for the, uh, the 3DS is apparently a great port I haven't played it myself but it adds some of the stereoscopic 3D and uh, it's uh, it's well regarded, so uh, it's apparently a pretty good version of the game to play if uh, if you want a handheld version. Uh, I love this game, guys. I um I don't we don't we haven't really talked about many any perhaps retro games on this uh, this show. Um, not necessarily because I don't think that they fit the premise of the show. It's just not something that has really been a part of what we've been doing. Um, but listeners, if you are interested in hearing us talk about more retro games as a part of the short game thing uh let us know and let us know which ones you think would sort of fit the uh the theme of the show uh we uh you know i i love playing old games i play a lot of old games uh but i don't always really know which ones kind of are short enough or easy to pick up and uh, complete in an evening or a weekend like we like to talk about. So if you have recommendations, let us know. Um, Or if you don't want to hear us talk about old games ever again, then let us know that too, but maybe in a nice way by going to our website, www.theshortgame.net, where we've got a feedback form and you can let us know. If you do love the show, then of course you can share it with your friends. That's the best way to help us out. If you know uh, an interesting person who likes video games or maybe even only kind of likes video games uh, but would maybe enjoy the show share the show with them if you really like the show one of the best things that you can do is review us on iTunes because um, I don't for sure know that it helps anything but every other podcast says that it helps. <laughs> so I think they're probably right um, did you find this show because you were looking on iTunes for short video games if so uh, why aren't there more people like you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you but, for searching. No, I, I'd love the to. I'd love to us. say a, a, a nice thanks to some of the recent reviews from Great the Dave, uh, from Some eighty seven, and from Brittany Coleman. And I really appreciate uh, any review you want to give us, even if it's a even if it's a one star review. But really, don't don't be that guy if you, if you hate the show that much. <laughs> just unsub. Uh, we're cool with it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to to write those. Uh, we really do appreciate it, and we assume that it helps because everyone says that it does. Um, so I've been your host, Reagan Kelly, and you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R A Y G A N K. Uh, Nate, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Nate STL. And Shane, where can people find you? I'm over on Twitter at 8BitShane. And thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully we'll uh, catch you next week on another episode of The Short Game. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can we go out to the, to the Aliens theme? Because that's like the best song. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs>